Hello and welcome to the mass spectrometry component of the DDAS module. This part of the module will contain 10 lectures and a practical element, and this is the first of these lectures. The standard design for delivery will be, as with this lecture, that I will post a set of learning materials online and these should be worked through before the timetabled session. During the sessions themselves, I will be online on Teams and we can chat through any questions you may have. And we'll also go through problems, many of which will be similar to the ones you will get in the exam. Within this mass spec course, we will focus on mass spectrometry fundamentals and the underlying instrumentation. Understanding these is essential before you can go on to become advanced users of mass spectrometry. So, where can we begin? I think the best place to start is to consider what a mass spectrometer can do for us. The aim of a mass spectrometer is to be able to weigh chemical molecules and give a measure of how many molecules have been weighed. From the weight of a molecule, or a fragment of a molecule, we can begin to identify it. And by counting the number of molecules that have been weighed, we can begin to quantify the concentration of solutions or the quantity of material in an original sample. But how can you measure the mass of something as small as a molecule? For example, consider reserpine, an antipsychotic and antihypertensive drug. The molecular mass is about 1 times 10 to the minus 21 grams per molecule. So how can we weigh something so small? I mean, we can't simply put a single molecule on a balance. The trick is that if we can charge the molecule and turn it into an ion, then we can control its motion using electric or magnetic fields. So we can accelerate it, trap it, steer it, detect it, break it apart or make it react with other molecules or ions. The process of adding charges to molecules is called ionization. Let's consider the use of electric fields in mass spectrometers first. Charged ions will be either attracted or repelled by voltages. So for example, if I put a positively charged ion between these two metal plates, for one's at 5 kV and the other's at ground, which way will the ion move? So the positive ion is repelled by the positively charged electrode and accelerates towards the ground electrode. Now if the ion was at rest and is now accelerating, that means that some force has acted upon it. If you remember your school level physics, the force applied to an object equals its mass times its acceleration. This is Newton's second law. You can click on the link to find out more. But where does this accelerating force come from? Well, the ion carries a charge and is sitting in an electric field. Using this knowledge, we can calculate the force that this field can apply to this charge. This equals the charge Q times the electric field strength E, where the electric field is the change in voltage divided by the distance. In this equation, dV means the change in voltage, and dU means the distance between the two electrodes. In mass spectrometry, when you see a little u like this in an equation, it's usually shorthand for saying that this is a measure in any one of the x, y, or z dimensions. So in this case, if the plates were spaced apart by 5 centimetres, then what would the electric field strength be? In this example, the iron is starting exactly in the middle of these two plates. This means that it will start at a potential exactly halfway between the two voltages. So that means that this iron will start at a potential of 2.5 kilovolts relative to the ground plate. As the iron accelerates towards the ground plate, it's building up kinetic energy. But how much kinetic energy does it build up? Well, luckily there's an easy answer to this one. There's a unit of energy known as the electron volt. Click on this link to find out more. But briefly, an object with a charge of a single electron, falling through a 1 volt potential difference, will pick up 1 electron volt of energy. So, as this ion accelerates towards the ground plate, by the time it reaches the electrode, how much kinetic energy will it have? 
In magnetic fields, ions experience a force that makes them travel in curved paths. The force on the ion is the product of its charge, Q, its velocity, V, and the magnetic field strength, B. But we won't go into very much detail about this situation, as we're not covering magnetic field-based mass spectrometers in this module. All classes of mass spectrometer use electric fields, magnetic fields, or both types, to measure the masses of ions. But in the pharmaceutical industry, these classes labelled in red are the most common types you will find, and you'll note that all of them operate using electric fields only. Within this module, we'll look specifically at time of flight, quadrupole, and iron trap classes of mass spectrometer. If you go on to further studies beyond this module, or go on to work in the field, you will cover Orbitrap and ICR class instruments as appropriate later. So, at a top level, how is a mass spectrometer constructed? Well, this is a systems map of a mass spectrometer showing all the major parts. The mass analyzer, this bit over here, is the subsystem that does the mass separation. But all the parts are needed in order for the whole system to work. We need some way of getting sample into the system, and that's the inlet. Then we need to find some way to charge the molecules and turn them into ions. That's the ionization subsystem, also known as the ion source. On some mass spectrometers, the inlet and the ion source are combined into a single system. After the ion source, we will have one or more mass analyzers, and then we need to detect the signals, so we need some kind of detection system. Ions can't fly very far at atmospheric pressure, so mass spectrometers normally require a vacuum inside them, and so we need a vacuum system. And finally, the days of controlling standard mass spectrometers using lots of knobs is gone, and we no longer get our mass spectra out as a photograph or a paper chart. So these days, all mass spectrometers come with a computer-based data and control system. And to recap, the mass spectrometer is the whole system, but the mass analyzer is the part of it that separates the ions according to their mass-to-charge ratio. Now, let's think about ion masses. Remember reserpine? Well, the mass of a single reserpine molecule was about 1 times 10 to the minus 21 grams. But no one likes dealing with indices like this, so grams are not really a good unit of mass for something as small as a chemical molecule. We could use zeptograms or yoctograms, and you should click on the link to get reminded about SI unit prefixes. But no one really uses zepto or yocto prefixes in practice, unless they're physicists. So in mass spectrometry, and in fact in chemistry in general, a different unit is used for molecular masses. Click on the arrow when you finish looking at SI prefixes and you want to move on to the next slide. The mass unit used for molecular and similar masses in chemistry is known as the Dalton. It's named after this handsome chap, John Dalton. A Dalton is defined as 1 12th the mass of a carbon-12 atom. This makes one Dalton about 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Now using this mass scale, that means that a reserpine molecule weighs 608.27 Daltons instead of 1.1 times 10 to the minus 21 grams. A much better unit. It's important to note that there was an older unit of molecular or atomic mass, known as the atomic mass unit. This was defined as 1 16th the mass of an oxygen-16 atom. But this unit is no longer used, and 1 atomic mass unit, or 1 AMU, is not equal to 1 Dalton. So it's very important not to use AMU anymore. Always use the Dalton instead. The Dalton normally has a unit label of DA, although sometimes a lowercase u, short for the unified mass unit, is used instead, and you may see that in the literature. You'll probably remember from your organic chemistry studies that one mole of carbon weighs 12.011 grams. But I've just defined the Dalton such that one atom of carbon-12 weighs exactly 12 Daltons. Similarly, 
One mole of reserpine weighs 608.68 grams, but one molecule of reserpine weighs 608.27 daltons. So ignoring the units, why isn't the relative molar mass the same number as the molecular mass? Well, the reason for this discrepancy is the fact that most elements naturally occur as different isotopes. For example, carbon naturally occurs in two stable isotopes, carbon-12 and carbon-13. There's also an unstable isotope, the radioactive carbon-14 used in dating, but its levels are so low that we can normally ignore that. Approximately 98.9% of all carbon is carbon-12, and that weighs exactly 12 daltons. But about 1.1% of natural carbon is carbon-13, and that weighs 13.034 daltons. But if we calculate the average mass of a carbon atom, adjusted by the relative abundance, then this turns out to be 12.011 daltons per carbon atom even though each individual carbon atom must weigh either 12 or 13.034 daltons. But mass spectrometers can detect the mass differences of the different isotopes. So it's very important in mass spectrometry to use masses measured in daltons, not in grams per mole, and to calculate the mass of a molecule using only the lowest mass naturally occurring isotopes for each element, not the average mass. The mass of the molecule calculated this way is known as the monoisotopic mass. So in order to calculate the masses of molecules and ions, it's necessary to use a table that lists all the exact masses of the various isotopes. I use the information kept on the SIS website. Either click on the link or on the image below and have a look at this website. The table there lists the masses and relative abundances of all the naturally occurring stable isotopes and is regularly updated as more accurate values become available. So, this website is a very useful resource to be able to use when you need to calculate molecular or ionic masses. For the session, make sure you've revised how to calculate molecular masses based on the elemental formula or the structure. So we've been looking at how to calculate the masses of molecules and daltons, but remember that mass spectrometers measure the effect of electric or magnetic fields on ions, not on charged molecules. Now in both types of field, the motion of the ion is affected by the charge, Q. We can rearrange both equations to pull the mass and charge components onto one side and leave everything else on the other side. So in both cases, you can see that the left-hand side of the rearranged equations is mass over charge. This is known as the mass-to-charge ratio. In this case, it would have units of kilograms per coulomb, because the equations work for SI units only. But in mass spec, we work with daltons, not kilograms. And we prefer to deal in units of charge that simply reflect the number of elementary charges on an ion. This means the number of excess or missing electrons. So when the mass to charge ratio is written using these concepts, it is written as m over z, and should be written in italics. Technically this unit is dimensionless, but very occasionally you may see it given the unit the Thomson and given the symbol th, but follow this link to find out more. The effect of dealing with ions, when we're using the mass to charge ratio as a measure of the mass, is that if you change the charge, then you change the apparent mass. So for example, if you double the charge, then you half the apparent mass. Take this example molecule, the neurotransmitter peptide substance P, as an example. If this appears in a mass spectrum as a singly charged ion, it would appear at a mass to charge ratio of 1346.7. But if it's doubly charged, then it would appear at only mass to charge 673.4. Consequently, in mass spec, it's very important to be able to work out what the charge on an ion is, and we'll go on to look at methods for this in the next session.
One key output of a mass spectrometer is a mass spectrum. A mass spectrum is usually shown as a graph like this. The x-axis is called the mass axis, even though its units will normally be the mass to charge ratio m over z. The y-axis is the intensity or abundance axis, and is normally unitless or arbitrary. On some instruments from some manufacturers it will be given the unit's counts, but these are approximate and shouldn't normally be taken as an exact measure of the number of ions recorded. Other key features in a mass spectrum can include the base peak. This is the highest peak in the visible spectrum or the spectral region. And the molecular ion. Now this molecular ion really has a very specific definition, being the radical cation generated from the removal of an electron from the molecule of interest. But in common parlance, it is usually used to define the peaks deriving from ionizing the complete molecule. In your undergraduate course, the main ionization source you probably studied was electron ionization, or EI. This used to be called electron impact ionization, but that term is now obsolete and shouldn't be used. Electron ionization is the most common ionization source used in gas chromatography mass spectrometry. And an EI source comprises a hot filament, usually made of tungsten or rhenium, that may have a repeller plate around or behind it. In use, this filament is heated like a light bulb until it glows. At the other side of the source is an electron trap. The voltage difference between the filament and the trap causes a stream of electrons to pass between them. A sample vapour is admitted into the source region and sample molecules diffuse into the electron stream. Electrons in the stream scatter off the molecular orbitals in the sample molecules and this transfers energy from the scattered electrons into the orbitals. If enough energy is deposited, then this can result in one of the electrons in the orbitals being ejected, leaving the molecule as a positively charged radical cation. This ion can then be analysed. Let's just watch that process again. Radical ions tend to be unstable and often fragment into smaller ions. Because electron ionization often results in fragmentation, it's termed a hard ionization method. A soft ionization source would not result in significant fragmentation after ionization. You should revise EI as a useful source of background knowledge for this module. Click this link as a great place to start. Although EI is a hard ionization source, commonly causing some degree of fragmentation as well as ionization, you can still often see the molecular ion in the mass spectrum. Being able to identify the molecular ion can be very useful when you're interpreting a spectrum. After all, this is what gives you the molecular mass. But you cannot always see the molecular ion, and you may have more than one compound in your spectrum. So how can you identify that a peak in an EI mass spectrum might actually be a molecular ion? Well, if you have only one compound in the spectrum, then the molecular ion should be the highest mass peak, excepting of course for its isotope peaks. The molecular ion must also be an odd electron ion, as it is a radical species, whereas many fragments will be even electron species. And we can test for whether an ion contains an even or odd number of electrons using the rings plus double bonds formula, which I'll come on to in a moment. Thirdly, the molecular ion must obey the nitrogen rule, at least for small molecules, where an odd molecular weight implies an even number of nitrogens, and an even molecular weight implies an odd number of nitrogens.
Finally, the molecular ion should be capable of producing the other high-mass fragments in the spectrum by logical losses from the complete molecule. The nitrogen rule concept should be familiar to you, and is easy to find online anyway, but let's go through the rings plus double bonds and logical losses concepts in more detail. If you have an elemental formula that you've guessed for an ion in an EI mass spectrum, then you can use the rings plus double bonds rule to predict if the ion must be an odd electron species, i.e. a radical ion. So, if your formula has C carbons, H hydrogens, N nitrogens and O oxygens, then we can use this formula to calculate a value for the number of rings plus double bonds, sometimes known as the rings plus double bonds equivalent or RDBE. If the RDBE value is a whole number, then the ion could be an odd electron radical molecular ion. But if the calculated value is not a whole number, then the ion cannot be an odd electron radical ion, and so it cannot be a molecular ion coming from EI. Let's try some example calculations. So you try. Using the rings plus double bonds rule, is an ion assigned with the formula C7H16N possibly a molecular ion? So with 7 carbons, 16 hydrogens and 1 nitrogen, that gives a rings plus double bonds number of 0 0.5, implying that this is an even electron species, so it can't be a molecular ion. OK, let's try with this ion. C23, H35, N, O2. Could this be a molecular ion? Yes, an ion with 23 carbons, 35 hydrogens, a nitrogen and two oxygens gives a rings plus double bonds number of 7, a whole number, implying an odd electron species and consequently possibly a molecular radical cation. Now there are limitations to this RDBE approach, especially when you need to include more elements and elements with valences over 5, but for many small molecules this approach can be really useful. Now let's look at the idea of logical losses. EI is a hard ionization source that often produces fragments. But these fragments aren't random, they're related to the structure of the molecule. Interpretation of the spectra from large or complex molecules requires an expert, but you should usually be able to identify at least some fragments that correspond to what you propose as the structure of your molecule. So let's take straight chain n-octane as an example. When ionized by EI, a small proportion of the molecules ionized are remaining as the molecular ion. And we know that this is only a small proportion because there is a peak in the spectrum corresponding to the mass of the molecular ion, but it's quite small compared to the other peaks. There are many fragments, but the main peaks in this spectrum correspond to ion masses that can be easily understood in terms of what has been lost from the molecular ion. Below the molecular ion, the next peak we see is 29 Daltons lower in mass, and this corresponds to the loss of an ethyl group from the main molecule. Then, there are a series of peaks corresponding to the losses of ever larger alkyl fragments, with masses separated by 14 Daltons, this being the nominal mass of the alkane repeat unit, CH2. The final fragment in this series has a mass of 29 Daltons, corresponding to the terminal ethyl group at the other end of the molecule. There are other peaks in this spectrum, and they correspond to fragment ions that have lost an alkyl group plus one or more additional hydrogens. But for a simple molecule like this, you can begin to see how the mass spectrum can give you clues to the structure of some parts, or indeed all, of the molecule. If we now jump up to a much larger alkane, here you can see a long series of sequential 14 Dalton or CH2 losses, 
and the molecular ion is now very small and might actually be hard to detect if the signal was weak. In mass spectra, the relative height of the peaks corresponds to the probability of a particular ion being formed and remaining stable enough to detect. For some compounds, many or most of the possible fragments are unstable and very quickly decay down to smaller, more stable fragments. But this can make interpretation difficult. Take, for example, these two amines. You can see from the spectra that both molecules predominantly form the same fragment at MZ30, corresponding to an ion of CH2NH2. The molecular ion peaks are very small and might well be undetected in a mass spectrum from a weak sample. And the small fragment that is detected is not very informative. So EI mass spectra can be effectively impossible to interpret in some cases, although they may still give you some small information about the molecule that formed them, in this case that it is an amine. By far the most common application of EI mass spectrometry is following gas chromatography. In gas chromatography, components in a mixture are separated broadly according to their boiling points. Use this link to find a useful introduction to GC provided by Agilent, one of the major suppliers of gas chromatography instruments. Whether or not you've encountered GCMS before, I recommend you follow this link and watch the video. Experts in EI mass spectrometry can manually interpret EI mass spectra to identify or propose some or all of the structure of the relevant analyte. However, this process requires a very high skill level and lots of experience, and many samples can contain hundreds or thousands of components where manual assignment is simply not efficient as a means to process these data. Therefore, in most industrial situations, the data from GCMS analyses will be processed using automated data analysis software that will extract the mass spectra of all the individual components in the mixture and send them to a library of reference mass spectra for identification. This process is very much faster than manual interpretation, but is not a magic bullet. Misassignments are common, often between structurally similar molecules or molecules that all fragment down to identical small fragments. Consequently, the identities of all important compounds should be manually reviewed, in the first instance. If an expert user agrees with a possible identity, then the next level of confirmation would involve purchasing or synthesizing that material and subjecting a standard solution of it to GCMS analysis to confirm both the retention time and the resulting mass spectrum, and only then would assignment be confident. During the development of small molecule pharmaceuticals, GCEI mass spectral data is often combined with both NMR and infrared data to identify or confirm the structure of molecules. Consequently, combining mass spec, infrared and NMR data is still a very useful skill to have, and this link will take you to some useful online resources. On the next slide is a very good video that is available on YouTube.
So given the information in the infrared, mass spec and NMR data, can you identify this molecule? Enter your answer simply as the name of the molecule. So if you'd identified ethanol, you just enter ethanol. And in the mass spectrum, can you see the molecular ion? Electron ionization mass spectrometry has a number of useful advantages. If you set up the ionization carefully, you can create very reproducible mass spectra. This is important because it's what allows you to be able to search your spectra against a library of spectra recorded elsewhere. Also, electron ionization is non-selective, so you're not biasing your ability to detect some but not other components in your sample, providing they're all volatile enough. And the fragments produced by EI allow you to get some structural information about an analyte that can be very useful for characterizing it or to allow it to be confidently identified. On the other hand, electron ionization mass spec has some weaknesses too. Your analytes must be volatile enough to allow them to be thermally vaporized into the gas phase prior to analysis without breaking down. For some classes of compound, this will require additional and time-consuming chemical derivatization. An example of this is that fatty acids are commonly analyzed as their methyl ester derivatives. And many larger molecules cannot be analyzed at all. For example, proteins cannot be vaporized without breaking down and so cannot be ionized by electron ionization. Also, EI only produces positive ions. This can be problematic for molecules that are better analyzed as negative ions, for example, military explosives and molecules containing halogens. And finally, as we saw earlier, many molecules fragment to such an extent that only very small fragments are detectable, and so all of the structural information and detail of the molecular weight is lost in the mass spectrum. As discussed earlier, the contents of this presentation was intended to largely be revision. So if any or all of this information was new, then please let me know. However, now you're at master's level, we will expect you to be able to seek out and find relevant resources online to help you revise or catch up on this material. During the timetable session itself, we can discuss this material, answer any questions you have, and go through some problems. I've also made an HTML5 version of this video. The benefit of watching the presentation in HTML5 mode is that you get to go through it at your own pace and answer questions and problems as you go along to help you understand the material. To find the HTML5 versions, go to the Kilgara Lab website at www.kilgaralab.com and then go to the teaching resources page. On there you'll find a whole variety of resources to help you learn about mass spectrometry. I hope you enjoy them.